Thank you for worshiping with us at Wesley today. It is a great joy to worship together. Worship is the most important thing we do because it connects us with God, with one another, and it's through our worshipful connection with God that God makes us the people that God desires us to be in this world. Now, let's worship God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us pray. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, thank you for joining us today as we wrap up our study of Romans chapter 8. Today, we'll be looking at verses 26 through 39. This is what the Apostle wrote. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep. For words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know, verse 28, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn within a large family. 
And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake we're being killed all day long, we are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Here in this text before us this morning, we see the Apostle Paul soaring to the height, I believe, of all that he writes to us in the New Testament. Here in this final section of Romans chapter 8, we read some truths that will help fill our lives with the glory and the presence of the Holy Spirit as we make our journey through this world, a journey that oftentimes is filled with great difficulty and even tragedy. You notice as this text begins, the apostle says that our weakness itself can become the very stage for the Spirit's amazing intimate work in us. Verse 26, likewise the Spirit helps us. We can stop right there. Likewise, the Spirit helps us, helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with groans too deep for words. Sometimes life is so tough, tough, so difficult, we don't even know how to pray. We don't know what to pray. We cannot even find the energy and the motivation within us to pray. And this promise is that in those moments, the Holy Spirit that resides within us is praying through us on our behalf, making intercession for us. And the prayers of the Holy Spirit within us are always according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit groans, prayers forth from our spirit to God. Sometimes when we don't know how to pray, sometimes when life has so beaten us down, perhaps the most significant thing we can do is sit in silence in the acknowledged awareness of God's presence and just allow the spirit within us to bubble forth those prayers to the ears of the Father. We also see in this text, in the famous, well-known verse 28 of chapter 8, that God works, works in all things, even horrible things, to accomplish His will in the life of His people. Romans 8, 28, we know Paul says we know not that we hope or we assume or we wish or we think. He says we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. God does not will all things that happens in this world 
or in our lives. God does not will all things, but God works in all things. This is a very familiar verse. I I hope that you really hear what the apostle is saying here. Paul is not saying that all things are good because all things are not good. There is much more than just the will of God being accomplished in this world. Sin, flesh, and the devil is at work in this world. But God works in all things, even in the horrible things, to bring about the good of God's people. God does not will all things, but God works in all things. Let me illustrate. I'll never forget... February the 28th of the year 2000. I was serving First United Methodist Church in Franklin, North Carolina, in the western part of our state. And that was the day that news spread rapidly through that small town that the remains of a newborn had been found in the city landfield. That traumatized that small town. And we were further traumatized there at First Methodist and the whole small town also when we discovered who it was that had given birth to that newborn. She was a remarkable young lady. She was a young lady that had been driven and an overachiever and had done well, a good student, upstanding member of our community, good work ethic. And she had never really experienced much failure in her life. And she didn't know how to handle that failure. That does not excuse what she did. But she was with child. And she was somehow somehow able to carry that child almost to term. And she delivered that child. And that child was born and... As soon as that child was born, this distraught, confused, young mother took the life of that child. It's a terrible story, but that newborn baby's remains ended up in the landfill there for Macon County. It was so traumatic for our community, so traumatic for that family. This young lady ended up being tried and went to prison for the killing, the murder of her child. I will never forget the day when me and the funeral director took the remains of that newborn baby to to give that newborn baby a Christian burial. It was a terrible time. But when I look back over that time now, what, what I want to remember most is out of that terrible event, out of that horrible event came North Carolina's first safe surrender law. That's a law where someone can turn over a baby up to seven days of life without even revealing his or her name as the parent, just turn that newborn baby over to a responsible adult. North Carolina's, North Carolina's first safe sanctuary law, since that law was enacted as a result of that tragedy in the year 2001 when the law took effect, over 20 newborn infants have been saved here in the state of North Carolina. God is always at work. God does not will everything that happens. Sin, flesh, and the devil is at work in this world, in this age. But God is always at work. We know that in all things, God works together for good. For those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. All things are not good. All things are not the will of God. Be very careful saying something like, all things happen for a reason. You need to be very careful when you say that because some things happen because of sin, flesh, 
and the devil. Some things happen because of our stupidity. But in the midst of what we create, the messes and the tragedies that we create, God is at work to superintend over and beyond our actions to bring good out of what happens in this life, to bring good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. Notice this promise is not generally given to everyone. This promise is given to those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. This promise is given to those who love God, who want the purposes of God to be fulfilled in their lives. That's the population that can claim this promise. We know that all things, in all things, God works together for our good. This is a great, great promise. And this promise will get us through the difficult days of living. So here in Romans 8, we make our way to the conclusion of Romans chapter 8. And the Apostle Paul begins this conclusion of this remarkable chapter by saying, what then are we to say about these things? These remarkable, amazing things, these promises of God, what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not withhold his own son but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. God has given us all things. God is on our side. God has given us his greatest treasure in Jesus Christ. That's how much God is for us. When we truly know that God is for us, then we can say with a fearless confidence, who can be against us? What can be against us? God is for us. God has given us his greatest treasure. Only Jesus Christ is the one who sits in a place where he can judge us. But Jesus Christ loves us more than we can ever imagine. And Jesus Christ ever lives to make intercession for us. He intercedes for us. We are on Jesus' prayer list. He prays for us, he intercedes for us, he stands in the gap for us. He is that great sacrament that pours the love of God in our lives. And the love of God in our lives will not be thwarted. What the love of God seeks to do in our lives will be accomplished. And life cannot stop that. Again, back to what The apostle says, verse 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. The apostle is quoting Psalm 44, a very a very popular psalm among those Jewish people who have given their lives for their faith. So life is tough. Sometimes it feels like we are simply sheep to be slaughtered. But in the midst of all this, we can declare, verse 37, know in all of these things, we are more than conquerors. I would be intent just simply being a conqueror. But Paul says we are more than conquerors. The Greek literally says we are super conquerors. We are hyper conquerors through him who loved us. Then Paul declares, I am convinced 
Verse 38, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth. And in case he misses anything, he says, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's a lot about life I do not understand. As a pastor, I've seen more tragedy than, than many people. I, I'm known, I'm rather famous for my navy blue blazers that I wear every day because I don't like many choices in the morning. So navy blue blazers and khakis. I remember that day I had to send one of my navy blazers to the dry cleaners because they'd been saturated with the blood of one of my members who took his own life. An amazing person, an amazing person. There's a lot about life I don't understand. There are a lot of tragedies we don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand it and I can't make sense of it when a fellow pastor, a colleague, a friend gets arrested at a local farmer's market for doing something that I really cannot imagine him doing. So we just pray, and when we don't know how to pray, the Spirit prays through us. There's a lot about life I don't understand. But I'm convinced about what I do understand. We know what we know. We know we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to His purpose. We know that nothing can separate us from the love of God that's poured out in our lives through Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing will stop the work of that overwhelming love in our life. I am convinced, my friends, I pray that you too will be convinced. Thank you for sharing this study of Romans 8 with us. We started the chapter with no condemnation. We end the chapter with no separation. And we know that throughout the chapter we have discovered some promises that God has given to us. May we allow these promises to be more real to us than any of the pain, any of the tragedies of life. May we not be consumed by what we don't understand about this world and this living, but may we be overwhelmed by what we do know. My friends, I'm convinced. I'm convinced of what the Apostle Paul speaks of in Romans 8, and I pray that you, you too, will be convinced. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Friends, thank you for worshiping with us at Wesley today. Thank you for your support of this ministry. Now go into the world to live as the body of Christ, and may the blessing of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and abide with you always. Amen.